Let's begin with tactics. So let's start with a pin. And after white wins the queen, the pawn ending will be a simple win. Now show me a fork. And after white wins the queen in this position, the knight and pawn ending is a win. Now let's combine the two. First let's make a pin. And after black saves his queen by capturing on b5, knight c7 makes the same fork. Tactical awareness plus playing to gain control of the center while developing the pieces will see any club level player through the opening better than knowledge of theory will. I also tell folks that they ought to take up gambit play because improving players ought to get in the habit of playing fighting chess because sooner or later every chess game comes down to a fight anyway. So improving players ought to engage in the tactics and the fighting as soon as they can while they're learning how to play this game. Here's an Alvin counter gambit for you. One of Black's most active replies to the old Queen's Gambit is to put a second pawn in the center. And White will look at Black askance and capture the free pawn on e5. And after White captures on e5, he's discovered a threat to the d5 pawn. Black oughtn't capture on c4 because that'll cost his castling privilege. But, so the move d4 inhibits white's normal course of development with knight c3. So white hates that pawn in d4, so he'll do everything he can to get rid of it. And black likes the pawn in d4, so he'll do everything he can to keep it there. And white hates the pawn on d4, so he'll do anything he can to get rid of it. And black wants to maintain it there, so he'll pin the knight which hits the pawn. Well, White will get tired of all this nonsense and just get rid of the stupid pawn. Black can capture on f3 and after the queen recapture, <laughs> knight d4 comes with a threat. And White has to be very careful here. Black is threatening knight c2 and the queen on f3. And if White makes a false step here meeting both threats, Here's our pin and fork combination. Remember this? First the pin, then the fork. Same pattern in a slightly more difficult game. This is how it works. You start with the skeleton of the pattern with just a few pieces on the board. First the pin, then the fork, then the pin plus the fork. Then the simplest eight move game to demonstrate the pin and fork combination Here's a different one. This is Barnett and Eastwood, Correspondence 1949. When white plays queen d4 in the center game, black certainly should play knight c6 to gain a tempo against the queen on d4. Eastwood played queen f6, and white should not swap the queens on f6 because every even trade favors the side whose pieces come forward as a result of the trade and if the players trade queens on f6 it's the black pieces that come forward so white dropped his queen back to e3 and black noticed that his king knight doesn't have its natural development square on f6 so he put the knight on h6 getting ready to play knight g4 to attack the white queen, white's knight does have its, its natural developing square. And after knight g4, white uh, attacking the white queen, white replied with a bigger threat of his own. Knight d5 hits the black queen, which would also make a check. So white's threat is bigger here. White is also threatening the, the fork on c7. Black met both threats with queen c6 and now queen f4 by white hits the knight on g4 and coordinates knight and queen 
against c7. Black figure d6 guards his knight with the c8 bishop and breaks the queen's line to c7, but when the d7 pawn moves, it clears the diagonal, and here's our pin and fork combination again. Pin, fork. Krauss Kostin demonstrates the same tactic in a more unusual position. If white plays e4 in this position, we would end up in a Mora gambit. But white instead chose to capture on c5, after which black forked to regain his pawn. And when white plays 4e4, he's certainly thinking about playing bishop e3 next to develop with another threat. But it almost looks as if white sees this whole combination coming. Because knight d5 has an insidious threat in mind. Black has no idea what's coming here. When he plays knight e7, b4 wins outright. Because there's only one safe square for the queen to run away from the pawn jab. The only safe square for the queen is c6, and we know what to do now. Plus fork. A couple of friends of mine played this game in a Bay Area Open Swiss some years back. After white plays the most natural two knight f3, black plays in 99% of the chess games two knight c6, but improving players ought not play knight c6 because it doesn't make any kind of a threat. If learning to play chess, they ought to get into the habit of making threats whenever possible, as soon as possible. Black has three threatening moves here that make an equal threat. White threatened e5. Black can play 2d5. Black can play Petrov's 2 knight f6 to make an equal threat to e4. Osmundo Reyes in this position played the most daring f5 to make an equal threat. f5 is most risky here because the advance to f5 doesn't do anything to help black's development. White is often happy to make the capture that centralizes his knight and black develops with a threat. The easiest move in the world for white to make now is d4 to fill up the center with pawns and to hold on to the knight on e5. That enables black to regain his pawn on e4. Bishop c4 develops with another threat. The move black would love to play is d5. d5 would put a second black pawn in the center while attacking the bishop. But black certainly can't play it now because it'll just lose a pawn to bishop d5. But when black played c6 to prepare d5, it simply forgot about white's threat to throw this check on f7, and now black loses his castling privilege. The king moves to d8. Now, our pin and fork combination doesn't work now, because if white plays bishop g5 in this position, black can capture and there's no fork on f7 because the bishop occupies the square. But knowing this tactical pattern enables white to find the right move at move 7, clearing the square for the knight fork by making a capture on g8, after which black resigned in light of rook g8, in fork. Playing to gain control of the center and developing the pieces while staying tactically alert will see you through any opening better than memorizing opening theory.